I am very much an advocate for following your whims, like those random impulses, those seemingly out of nowhere interests or callings to go and do something. I break purpose down into two things. So there's the seed of our purpose, which influences our fullest expression over this lifetime. And then there's our purpose expression, like the way that our purpose expresses through us. I really feel contribution is the ultimate expression of purpose. And that means something different to everyone. Stephanie Zamora is an author, a coach, a business and marketing strategist, and the founder of Stephanie Zamora Media. Along with many other things, Stephanie's work helps to catalyze individuals on their healing and growth journeys so they can uncover the purpose of their path, step into who they're here to be, and do the work that they're here to to do. We're going to be talking about purpose today. We're going to be talking about goals. We're going to be talking specifically about how to transform your dreams into actionable goals so that you can manifest your success with those goals. You know the fee for the broadcast. If we make you smile, if we make you laugh, if you learn something that you're going to take and use to make your life even 1% better, then all that we ask is you share this show with just one other person who could use it as well. So without further ado, let's talk to Stephanie Zamora. Stephanie, it's great to have you here all the way from New Mexico. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm excited too. So you do a lot of things. Today, I want to focus on your strategies and philosophies behind living a better life, turning your dreams into reality because you've, you've, you have decades of experience in this field, which is super cool. But you also work with business owners and entrepreneurs as a media agency. And guys, there's going to be links in the description. You got to go check out Stephanie's website. We're going to be talking about the cool things that she's got going on there. But uh, Stephanie, why don't you tell us, how did you find yourself on this path of helping people really lean into the best version of themselves and really find their true path? Yeah, it was very organic. So I always say that purpose is my purpose. And part of the reason for that is I am one of the many people who feels like they were born at the wrong time on the wrong planet. Like this world just never made sense to me. And so I was a very existential child. Like when all of my friends were at the mall and, you know, gossiping about boys, I was at home writing angsty poetry and trying to figure out what the point of everything was. So really trying to understand purpose has been a thread in my life for as far back as I can remember. And I what always knew that I, oh, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off, but like, it sounds like you knew from a very young age that one, you were different than other people, but two, it seems like it came natural to you. These things that you enjoyed. Is that something you think you yes. were born with or that you learned? I believe a lot of it was born with like the whole nurture over nature thing. I think there are aspects of self that are very much nature. They're just wired and hard coded into who we are. And then we go out into the world and we get shaped by life. And that influences our purpose as well. Very cool. So that's something you feel like most of it you were born with then the, the, yes. the, the angst to write poetry, the angst yes. to express yourself creatively. <laughs> Absolutely. And I've learned a lot about personality typing, which I know some people are resistant to, but I find it to be a great framework to get to know yourself better. And so there are certain personality types that inherently feel like they are different and, and don't belong and fit in. And it's a lot more people than you would expect. Yeah. So if for those people who feel that they aren't fitting in with what they see around them, people doing these things where everyone else is following along, they're getting the engagements on social media, but they're thinking to themselves, am I different because I'm not interested in that? Am I different because I'm not getting this specific engagement? What would you say to that personality type or types of people? I always say it's not your job to fit in. I think as humans, we really crave connection and belonging. And part of that is for our safety and survival. But when you're wired differently, that's your purpose. That's part of your purpose expression and who you're here to be in the world. And the people that think differently, that move differently, that live differently, there is so much contribution in that on its own, just being who you're here to be and thinking differently. And I had to learn that for myself. One of the first things I was ever praised for when I started blogging publicly was, wow, I never thought about that. Thank you for sharing your mind with me. And so for anyone that feels like they don't belong, you're not supposed to. That's not your role. And when you were going through that path, when you're blogging, you're receiving comments like that, did it just jump out at you to start a business to help other people do this? Or was it something where you just did your thing? You expressed yourself and the opportunity found you? 
I just expressed myself. So I started blogging under my own name. I had blogged anonymously for many years back in 2009. And when I decided to start my first business under my name, I think I just wrote for about nine months before I started hearing from other people that they wanted to find their own passion and purpose. And that led me to create my first program. So it was very organic. That's very cool. Very cool how you found yourself here. And we'll dive more into that. But I know there's a lot of people, especially who I was when I was 21. So that's seven years ago now, where I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I was really good at sales. I was really good at talking to people. I knew how to make money, but I wasn't happy. And I had no idea what the next step was. And things only changed for me once I had a mentor come into my life to share some harsh words with me, pretty much saying, Brandon, like, you're not happy. It's clear to see that you're not happy. You're really good at this, but what about your fitness? What about your relationships? What about what the people you work with think about you? What about self-respect? And it was only once I received that harsh advice that I realized, wow, like I'm good at one area, but all these other areas are kind of falling apart. And I know a lot of people right now, especially with uncertainty in the world and the way that the world's changed over the past few years, who maybe they were laid off. Maybe they found a different job. Maybe they found a new path. Like for those people who are unsure of where their purpose lies, is there a specific place that you ask them to look in order to start making progress on that path? Absolutely. And I find that most people already know what their purpose is and what they're passionate about. They will tell me, I have no idea what it is and then proceed to lay it out. <laughs> so it's very much inherent to who we are a lot of the times. And when you're really disconnected from yourself or you're really off track or in your, like in your case, you've been focused on one thing because it's what you're good at. It's easy to lose sight of what that thing is. And so I am very much an advocate for following your whims, like those random impulses, those seemingly out of nowhere interests or callings to go and do something. And it's not because I always use the example, if you're a lawyer, right? And all of a sudden you have this urge to start painting. It doesn't mean that your purpose is necessarily to be a painter, but there's something in the experience of following through with that, where you're going to meet other people, where you're going to learn something about yourself. It's their stepping stones to uncovering what our purpose is. So if you're really disconnected and you have no idea, most people won't share what their purpose is or what they're passionate about because they're like, it's so unreasonable. It's so ridiculous. Everyone will judge me. But for the people who truly don't know, start following those wins. I really like how you said that and all the things that you just said there, like the idea where people say they're not sure what they're meant to be doing, but then they go about explaining it verbally to you and they just like <laughs> throw it up verbally. But I mean, the thing is, most people aren't asked, what do you believe your purpose to be? And most people don't take the time to outwardly say with actual words, not just in their mind, what they're great at, what they enjoy doing, what they want their life to look like. I just reread Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Mm. And I read this book originally, and I know this book's talked about all the time, so I, it feels annoying to even talk about it, but it is really a great book. But it's, uh, I read it when I was 18. And I didn't really appreciate it because it was like the first time that I really read anything along those lines. Maybe I was 19. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> but I reread it last week and I was like, whoa, this stuff yeah. totally escaped me. And there was a, an exercise in the book that I would recommend to people. It's literally at the very end of the book. It's like three pages from the end. And he gives you a list of like 60 questions. And he asks you to read the questions out loud. And then form your response to those questions verbally out loud. And I found myself like coming to some real realizations from that exercise. But what you just laid out was the exact same thing. Like, what if everyone listening right now, what if I asked you, what is your purpose? Like, what are you great at? What do you want to lean more into where this inner inclination says, hey, I kind of want to paint something, but I'm not a great painter. Like I meet so many people and I'm sure you do too who say, I really want to do this, but I'm not good at this. And it's like, well, duh, you're not good because you haven't tried it. You haven't become good at it through practice. So yeah. go paint, right? Go draw, go write something. Even if you make 5,000 edits to it, go do exactly what you said. Explore your wins, explore your interests. Like for me, it's guitar. I'm not the best guitar player, but I've been playing since I was 16 and I've gotten better and I've gotten better and I've gotten better. And now I look back at this and I think to myself all the time, I'm so grateful that I started guitar at that time because now it's something I can pick up and I can impress people. But most importantly, I can have fun and express myself in a way that I wouldn't otherwise be able to. 
So I think that's beautiful how you how you said that. Thank you. And I would also say pay attention to what sends you into a passionate ramble rant. Like the things that you get really ranty about, it doesn't mean necessarily that your purpose is to be an advocate for that cause. But if you go to the heart of the things that you're really amped up around that you care about deeply, like there's just so much at the depth and the bottom of those things that we're And everybody has gone into a ramble rant about something and it's different than just being annoyed or frustrated. It's like when you feel very strongly about something, dig into why that is. 100%. Absolutely. Now, when it comes to purpose, right, we're headed into that time of the year where most people who aren't like frequent goal setters are about to create some goals, right? And they're like, okay, well, this coming year, 2023 is going to be the best year ever because I'm going to accomplish this. I'm going to be in the gym. I'm going to lift. I'm going to find that girlfriend, find that boyfriend, find that love interest, whatever it is. And then most people fall off that goal, right? And it's, they have good intentions. They want to change their life. They want to make progress, but we are our patterns, right? So the question is, is goal setting and purpose connected and kind of a two part here? Should you know and understand your purpose before you create goals? What comes first, the chicken or the egg, goals or purpose? That's a great question. And I would say it can go either way. The key is that you really deeply, truly from your heart and your soul, from the core of your being are going after something that you want. A lot of the goals we set, especially these new year goals where we're like, I'm going to get in shape and I'm going to have the partner and I'm going to buy the house and I'm going to make this much money. They're things that we might want, but a lot of the times they're very ego-based or they're things that we think we should want, things that we think we should do. And so you have to tap into the truth of what you really desire and what you're really called to create. And it has to be so important and so meaningful and big enough to you that it will pull you through the work required to bring it to life. And so if you can't find that thing that really tugs at you, that really calls you forward, then you might have to go back and do some of the purpose work of coming into alignment, of getting to know yourself, of learning to trust yourself and your intuition again and know what's really important to you. So it really depends on where you're at. If you're in alignment, but maybe you're not clear enough to say my purpose is X, Y, and Z, you might still be aligned enough that you're like, I know that I'm called to create this, but it has to be something that you really want that's meaningful to you. Do you think purpose is generally synonymous in a way with creation of something? I believe it's synonymous with contribution. And so for a lot of people, that's creation. But it's important to me that people understand, like I talk a lot about your purpose and your purpose work. And work is not necessarily the work that you do for money or the business that you run or the job that you hold. For a lot of people, it can be. But for other people, it's writing, it's raising a family, it's traveling and jumping off of mountains, whatever you're called to do. And so I really feel contribution is the ultimate expression of purpose. And that means something different to everyone. I completely agree because this show is a piece of purpose work, right? And it's one of the biggest pieces of purpose work for myself. And I started it several years ago, never with the intention of making money from the show. And I'm still not making very much money from the show. Some people like family and friends are like, whoa, you know, you must be doing pretty well. 200 something episodes. (laughs) It doesn't quite work that way, right? It can if you want to make this like the main avenue of revenue. But I host this show because I love talking to people like you. I love learning new things myself. But I think most importantly, I really enjoy hearing from people that I do spend time with presently when they say, I really enjoyed this episode with Stephanie. I really enjoyed this episode with Gary when he talked about this and you forget that people actually listen to this, right? But yeah, they do. And then more and more people listen, the more and more time you do it, just like the more time you spend learning to play the guitar, you're going to get better. The more time you spend with the art, you're going to get better. At the beginning, you're not very good. At the beginning, I had a blank curtain behind me. At the beginning, I didn't have a microphone, right? Just like for you. I'm sure at the beginning, it looked very different. At the beginning, you were blogging anonymously, right? It wasn't even under your own name. And I guess that's probably a good question of why you blogged anonymously. I have an idea, but I'll I'll ask you that in a minute. But this piece of work, this podcast is very much aligned with my purpose. And the days that I record on, what's today, Monday? On Mondays and Thursdays, I really look forward to speaking to the guest on that day and preparing for the show and organizing some questions. And without this, there would be a gap, right? Because I make money out in other ways, but without this, I would feel that a lot of what I'm doing is only to make money. And like you said, 
it doesn't have to be purpose work from the standpoint of you, you're making your money from it. It can be something that you're not making money from for a very long time. And then maybe one day you will, right? But you go at it from the intention of, I want to do this because it aligns with my soul. It aligns with who I am. It aligns with my strengths. I enjoy it. And like you said, it also gives and contributes to other people. Absolutely. And I would say this is part of your fullest expression. To me, purpose is being who you're here to be and doing what you feel called to do. So this show, which is incredible, and you're an amazing host, and you're so great at this, is as much a part of your purpose expression as you learning and continuing to play the guitar. And our showing up in our fullest expression and living a life that feels fully aligned for us is one of our greatest contributions in and of itself. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for your kind words. And I love where this conversation is going because it's going, it's going deep, but deep in a very realistic and practical way, because I feel like we've already touched on several different things that people can listen to rewind, go over again and actually take something away from this conversation. So thank you. And we're not even done yet, which is super cool. We still got more to do. <laughs> so has your purpose over the last few years or even like the last half decade, right? Because you've been doing this for a while. Has your purpose evolved or changed? Has it stayed consistent or has it changed drastically in any ways? That's a great question. So to answer that, I want to first define what purpose means to me. So I shared it's being who you're here to be and the work you feel called to do. But I break purpose down into two things. So there's the seed of our purpose, which influences our fullest expression over this lifetime. And then there's our purpose expression, like the way that our purpose expresses through us. So for you right now, a piece of that purpose expression is having this podcast. And the expression of our purpose is shaped by two things. It's shaped by how life shapes us as we go through life and have experiences and the times that we live in. And so my journey with purpose expression has been a great example of that. The core of it has stayed the same. Like if you look at the thread throughout my life, like I shared earlier, it's always been centered around purpose and existentialism. Like what is the point of this? What is the purpose of life? How do I build something that's meaningful and, and live a legacy? And when I started this business, what I focused on was very different. I focused on helping women through the quarter life crisis because that's what I was going through in my early 20s. And from there, they all became very entrepreneurial and I had started growing a successful business. So I started teaching them how to start their own businesses and it evolved with me as I evolved. And then in 2014, I went through a really traumatic loss that left me with PTSD that completely unraveled everything I thought I knew to be true about myself, the world, my business came to a halt, my health tanked. Um, I ended up in an abusive relationship. I filed bankruptcy like Literally everything came undone in my life because of this. And I learned so much about healing from trauma and what it meant to rise up and come back in the aftermath of challenging experiences. And so that changed the expression of my work. Like my work is very similar, but it's far richer. There's far more depth to everything that I do. And that's because of what I went through in my life. And then as the world has changed, as we've gone through certain things over the last couple of years, I've started to talk more and learn more about systems and how systems come into play with our purpose. So yes, if you were to look from the outside, it looks like I've been doing kind of exactly the same thing the entire time, but it's been directly shaped by everything that I've gone through. Wow. That was a big answer. And I appreciate you sharing those things, by the way, because I know it's one thing to share something. I think it's one thing to share something with someone. It's another thing to share something with a lot of people in the attempt to help those people navigate through that part of their own journey. Because the reality is no matter what goals you create, no matter what purpose you align with, there's going to be setbacks. And sometimes those setbacks are going to be giant setbacks. And I commend you for moving through that time, learning from that time and being here now to share your experiences from that time. And there's realistically only going to be more setbacks in the future, right? But now you're stronger because of what you've already been through. So, that opened up a new can of worms, which is incredible. So how did you, how did you do that? How did you move through that difficult experience of, of losing someone or something, finding yourself in that abusive relationship and then moving out of that, being aware of it, I'm sure moving yourself out of that to where you are now. Like, how do you, that's a lot. Like, can you unpack that for us? How did you do that? 
Yeah, I would say I'm very grateful to whatever part of me instinctually knew to feel everything fully. And part of that, again, goes back to my personality, my energetic wiring, who I am. I'm very emotional to begin with. Like emotions of all kinds are welcome with me. <laughs> and so after my loss, it was an ex-boyfriend who committed suicide shortly after we broke up. I just knew instinctually to feel everything fully. And I would, I was kind of, I don't know if aggressive is the right word, but intentional. Like if something triggered my grief, I would stare at that something or I would think that thought or I would sit in that memory and I would let it just break me completely and let those emotions move through fully. So nothing got stored in my body during that time. And that was really critical because even if you're not going through a traumatic experience or a, a big loss like that, like we all have emotions that come up and we're not taught how to feel them. We're not taught how to process them. Mm. And when you don't process them, they get stored in your body. And that becomes part of the patterns that you experience and the way that you react versus respond. And so that was the first thing. And then from there, being somebody who is so existential and seeks to make meaning from everything, I was just constantly aware of what was going on and trying to figure out what was going on inside of me and how that was affecting everything around me. And I'm a seeker, so I'm always trying to answer questions. I'm always trying to understand things. And so when the PTSD, for example, was so bad that I couldn't even run my business, like I couldn't remember half of my clients, I couldn't remember how to code websites, it was like, okay, this doesn't work for me. What do I need to understand in order to heal? And so I would read books about PTSD and trauma, and I couldn't remember anything I read, so I would read it again. And so I would say for me, and it's part of my wiring and just how I approach life, is I really worked hard to understand what was happening and why. And I am also, and I try to teach this to my clients in different ways. Like I am willing to go into the hard stuff because I understand what's on the other side of it. So when it came to healing from the trauma, from the abuse, from rebuilding my business after bankruptcy, it was like, okay, this is going to be hard. And just normalizing that, not making it this big, scary thing. But instead, okay, it's going to be difficult. What are the challenges? What is it that I need to do? What do I need to heal? What do I need to learn? And just continuing to do that. Wow. So you've got these emotions stored in your body, right? And did you did you understand about emotion storing in your body as you went through this time? Or did you understand it only after you educated and looked back at the experience? Afterwards, yeah. So, okay, you've got these emotions stored in your body. You're not quite sure what's going on. You say to yourself, I want to understand this better. I want to heal. I want to move move through this experience. You read books on it. You reread the books trying to memorize everything, which is great because that's that's a very intuitive thing to be aware that you're not feeling the way that you want to feel. You're not where you want to be. You're not sure what's next. So you decide to learn. You decide to grow. Was there a moment that you finally said, I'm on the right path. And, and how long were you in this, this chapter of understanding, this chapter of education before you arrived at the moment of understanding that you are making progress forward? Gosh, it was probably about four years after my loss when things really clicked into place because I had six months after my loss where my brain deteriorated and then I ended up in the abusive relationship for a year and a half because of my PTSD. And then after that, like my life was just in chaos and I was a shell of a person. And so it was in the year after that, that I really started to learn very specific concepts about not just healing and growth, but how we can work with the universe. And this is the part that I think some people find a little woo-woo, but to me, it makes perfect sense. Science just hasn't caught up yet. So I learned how to engage with the world in a different way. And I learned a ton about way of being work. And I started to practice it and implement it and experiment with some of these processes that I teach now. And so I would say about four years, I still had a long way to go. But it was four years in that I had completely transformed my financial situation like overnight. And I had started to rebuild my business and I, I changed my life. I moved. I got a forerunner I could sleep in the back of. I moved to the mountains. Like everything started to shift. And even though it would be a couple few more years before it would really lock in and I would really feel like myself again, that was the point that I was like, okay, I'm doing stuff. <laughs> yeah. Is that when you moved to Colorado? 
So I was in Colorado, but I moved from the front range up to the mountains. Oh, beautiful. That's awesome. I've never been there, so I don't know the difference between it's, the different yeah. ranges, but I'm assuming that when you were making that move, there was a lot of fear, right? And you said you lived in Hawaii for a time too. So you were you were born and raised in New Mexico. You you spent this time in Colorado and then you went to Hawaii. Like that's a big change, right? That change of environment. And I guess kind of a two-part question here. How did you move and push through the fear in order to move and completely uproot your life where it was? And how did that change of environment help you? It's mm, a great question. So fear, first of all, is something that I've worked with for a long time. So I love the quote and I can never remember the quote author, but fear <laughs> is just excitement without the breath. Like when we can breathe into it, it's just an energy that we can work with. Hmm. And fear comes up for different reasons. So understanding fear, I think really helped, but something that has really really changed my life is understanding this concept of the terror barrier. And so anytime that we go against the known and familiar, we move away from it. We go after a big goal, even if we're consciously excited about it, our conscious mind is like, mm -mm, we're not going to survive this. And it throws up everything that it can to get us to stop. And so learning about this and seeing how it's played out in my own life when I decided, cause I left all my friends, all my community to move up to the mountains and I did it very intentionally, which will answer your second question. But there was a ton of fear and I hit a terror barrier. And essentially, that's all of the internal stories come up, the fears, the limiting beliefs. You will either create situations that stress you out and overwhelm you and give you anxiety or you will fixate on them. So life suddenly feels impossible. And we start to internalize this as the universe is saying, this is a no for me. Like I should just go back to the known and familiar. I'm not cut out for it. And so understanding and normalizing that anytime that I make a change, especially a big one, I'm going to experience some degree of this terror barrier makes it easier to just weather it and move through it. And that doesn't mean it's not hard and it doesn't almost stop you, <laughs> but it's like, okay, I know why this is happening. This is just my subconscious response. And if I can get to the other side of it, my subconscious will learn that I can survive this and I'll be okay. And, and that was the case for me. Like I knew that's what was happening. And so I, I went through the motion of moving and leaving my community. And I very intentionally chose where I ended up because, because of everything I had been through, I had lost sight of myself and I couldn't hear myself anymore. Like I had given my power to everyone around me and they were not helping me make the right decisions for me. So I chose to move to this valley where I knew no one. It was incredibly inconvenient to live there. There's no Uber. <laughs> like you can't <laughs> just get around if you, if your car breaks down and a place where it was hard for me to meet people so that I could spend so much time with myself breaking down in ways that I needed to further to heal, but also just coming home and being able to hear myself again. That's amazing. Did you start to hear yourself shortly after you got there? Or how much time did it take in order to really hear that inner voice once again? It happened pretty quick. And part of the reason for that is I'm a very big advocate as much as people push back on this in stepping away from a lot of relationships when you need to and when they're no longer serving you. And so I had key people in my life who were like my favorite people, my best friends, the wisest, most experienced and incredible humans. But I had given them so much of my power that it was like I had to cut those friendships and relationships off for a while. And so I didn't talk to some of those people for a year some of them a couple of years and even just getting to the valley and not having anywhere to go and no one to see and no one I knew nearby and not talking to these people every day like I had been. It was very quick that I started hearing my own intuition again. That's powerful. Yeah, we are a product of our environment in so many different ways, not just our physical environment, but the people that we're spending our time with. We can be one person around a specific group of people. And when I say group, I, I mean one person, sometimes two people and uh, three, then you've got tons of energy surrounding you. But you're a different person here than when you're here. And I think that that quote of fear is just excitement without the breath. I've never heard that before. It's really cool. It reminds me of a quote I heard. It's not really as much of a quote as much of an idea that confidence and anxiety and nervousness, they're really all a very similar emotion, right? Like if you think of a time where you felt confident, like your, your heart rate might increase a bit, you might get sweaty palms, you might, your thoughts might be racing, right? When you think of that, when you think of nervousness, the, the emotions are very similar, right? There might be small differences in your body, but 
again, self-awareness as to how you feel, self-awareness that you're experiencing that fear. And like what you said, self-awareness to say, I'm going to uproot myself and move to a different environment. From what I've heard about your story, and I'm sure there's so much we're not going to be able to get into. From what I've heard, your story is very much one of self-awareness, self-understanding, and really everything that comes down to understanding who you are. And when you didn't understand who you were, you asked yourself questions, right? And the answers you got back then are very, very likely to be different, if not totally different than the answers that you would get now. But I think this is a lesson for everyone. And even if you're not the personality type to ask yourself these questions all the time, put yourself out of your comfort zone. Ask yourself these hard questions, right? You've got a workbook that's called Making the Impossible Inevitable. And guys, I highly recommend you go grab this workbook. The link's in the description. I'll ask you about this workbook here in a bit. But this will help guide you through some of that self-discovery to really define, okay, who are you? What is your purpose? What can you lean more into? What do you want to do next when it comes to creating goals? So if we take everything that we just talked about and now move back now to creating goals, once you leaned back into your purpose and you once again heard yourself, what does the process of creating next steps and goals look like for you now that you've leaned into your purpose? Yeah, that's a great question. And I would say it varies depending on the person and the goal. But you know, speaking to the workbook, what I find is most important is really tapping into the vision of what it is that you want to create and why you want to create it. And once you're really clear on that, who is the you that has it? And pulling that consciousness and ener the energetic frequency of that person into the now so that you can start making plans and decisions from there. And the reason for that is like the way that we bring our big, exciting, impossible or not visions and goals to life is through our way of being. And so everything is influenced from who you are being in the world. And there's a lot to this. There's context, there's limiting beliefs, there's healing and clearing work that we have to do to really be in alignment. But when you're anchored in who that person is, and a lot of the times we think we have to have the thing to be the person, but really it's the other way around. So if you can be that person now and you can start making decisions as them, you can start having conversations as them, you can start moving as them, not only will you get clear on the steps that you need to take to make it happen and what that looks like and the support that you need, but you become a clearing for it. Like you create a channel that it can move towards you from, which again, I know for some people, this is a little bit out there, <laughs> but it's just very much like you have to come into alignment with the thing that you say you want and you have to be the person that can have it and hold it. And when we're being that person, we make a completely different set of decisions. We take a completely different set of actions. We engage in completely different conversations. And so you put yourself on a trajectory to have it far more quickly. You have a gift of explaining things that are very deep in a very simple way. Thank you. Because even if like I really could have used that advice seven years ago, and I, I really want to touch on a few things you said there because that's really powerful. I asked you about what setting goals looks like. You didn't say, okay, make sure it's specific. Make sure it's measurable. Make sure it's actionable. You didn't go through the smart process. You simply said, who is the version of yourself that has achieved that goal, right? What are they doing? on a daily basis that who you are now isn't doing, right? So it's very simple of this person, this version of you that has the goal, what is in that gap? What is that gap between where you are now and this person who's achieved it, right? Because I do believe that you can have and become whatever and whoever you want to become. I do believe that. But like you said, it comes down to the things that you're doing on a daily basis. The key word is doing. So when I was 21, Finally, I had that mentor who helped me in a different way. He didn't, he didn't say it as eloquently as this, but I knew that if I wanted to be promoted, I had to start adding value to people around me. I wasn't adding value to the people around me. I was just making money for myself. I wasn't helping those around me, and I was very cocky about my own performance. I knew that if I wanted to add more value to people, I had to be clear-minded. I couldn't be smoking weed every day in the morning at the end of the day, right? I, I eliminated that from my life completely, right? And that made big changes alone. We could talk about that forever. I knew that I couldn't be going out every single weekend because that would sap my energy for the first several days of the week, right? So I made very specific changes in the actions that I took 
And that completely changed my life and brought me closer and eventually to the version of myself that I wanted to become to realize these goals. Well, and if I can add the important piece to that is it's not just what we're doing. Like all of those actions that you did stemmed from a change in your way of being, like who you believed yourself to be and the context that you held for your own life and your work shifts first and then influences all those actions. And it was really, really freaking hard. Yes. It was really hard. <laughs> and I also had to assess who are the people in my life who are not conducive to this new version of me. And I didn't move, I sim which made it even kind of more difficult in a way because I had to make a path around these specific people because I really enjoy these people and they're still friends of mine to this day. I haven't seen some of them in a very long time because I know if I spend time around these specific people, no matter what, they're going to have some type of influence around me because even if you are, even if you do guard your mind, we're beings of energy. That energy is going to seep in, in both directions. I can help them, but they're also going to seep into me. So I started to, like you said, become very conscious of the people that I was spending time around. And I started spending more time with my mentor. I started spending more time with books, right? With, with mentors that weren't even physical to me. I started finding people online like Jim Rohn, Tony Robbins, Mel Robbins, all these incredible virtual mentors. So Again, it just brings us back to who are the influences you're spending time around? What are the actions you're taking on a daily basis? And how can you close that gap between where you are now and where it is you want to be? Yes. I love it. Love this conversation. So let's talk about your workbook. And I guess my question for you, for you when it comes to the workbook is who did you make this for? And what can people, what will people take away once they go and download that workbook? I know we're not supposed to say this as business owners and marketers, but I made it for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason that I made it is because I, the reason that I developed this whole methodology is very much what you said earlier, which I really appreciate the reflection of simplifying things down. What I learned in learning about all of this work and, and living this process myself is that like the secret to making the impossible happen, it's not a secret. It's a process. It's a process that you can learn and live. And I feel very strongly that there's two pieces to the work, whatever work, whether you're listening to this conversation or another one on the show, or you're learning something somewhere else. There's the intellectual understanding, which is key. It gives you a certain amount of leverage to understand what's happening and why and how processes work and what you need to shift and all of this. And second, there's living it. And so this methodology that's in the workbook, it will give you an overview of the five phases. And it's a matrix methodology because as we move towards something, bringing it to life, we go through the five phases, but we weave back and forth between all of them. And so it lays this out in the workbook, but it is, it breaks the process down because making the impossible happen, like it's not magic and people who do it are not special. They just have learned how to move through life and engage with life differently. They've learned how to step into that different way of being. They've learned and done the work around healing their trauma and understanding their subconscious strategies that keep them in the known and familiar. And the thing about making the impossible happen, I could go on about this all day. I'll try to keep it short. Like the thing about making the impossible happen is that the very strategies that have kept us as safe, secure, and successful as we have been so far is the thing that makes what you feel is impossible, impossible. And so the, the workbook is gives a high level overview and helps you start workshopping some of the key important pieces. But I really, I just wanted to put it out there because there's far too many people that give up on things because they seem impossible, whether that's finding healing and a new sense of wholeness after a trauma or a loss or understanding your purpose and building a life and business around it or making changes in your relationships and your health and your bank account. Like the process to making those things inevitable is the exact same process. And once you understand it and you can really start living it and you can start stepping out of these strategies that the subconscious has, like the whole world opens up to you. And as much as I could charge for doing this work and I do do this work one-on-one, -on -one, like I want more people to understand this because it's such a foundational piece of living your purpose and being who you're here to be and contributing in the way that only you can. Wow. Guys, if you've enjoyed this conversation so far and you've taken a lot away, which I know you have because I personally have, then just imagine what you're going to find when you download this workbook. And this workbook is free to download, guys. You'll go to the website, enter your name and email. She'll send it right over to you immediately. And you've seen how reflective 
Stephanie is in her own life and what that's allowed her to do, how that's allowed her to evolve. Imagine what's involved in this workbook that was handcrafted by her. Go grab a copy. Link is in the description. For those listening, though, the, the workbook is at stephaniezamora.com slash make it happen. And links are in the description. I have one more question to ask you because your journey has had ups, it's had downs, and it's had ups since that point, right? And I'm curious, as your journey has changed and it's brought you to where you are now, what would you say you are most grateful for? in your life right now? Right now, I am really deeply, truly grateful for the relationship that I have to myself because I lost sight of myself for so long and my life came completely undone because of it. And like, even after I started getting back on track, like the relationships and experiences that I had were just not good. And so I am at a place in my life where I'm really creating a life that feels fully aligned for me. And I'm very deeply fulfilled by everything that I'm doing work-wise and relationship-wise and where I am. And so doing the work to build that relationship to myself, doing the work, like I bottomed out very intentionally and very deeply and hard over the last couple of years so that I could clear everything that was keeping me from being who I'm here to be. And I've never been clear in my work. I've never been clear in my life. I've making moves that just fill me up that are so different, but are right for me. And so, yeah, doing the work and having this relationship to myself again, like it's, it's everything. That's a beautiful answer and very inspiring. And I'm so happy for you and the Thank progress you. that you've made in your own life. Thank you very much for coming on the show, Stephanie. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you so much. And thank you for this work that you do. Thank you. I hope you took a ton away from this conversation. We took it in so many different directions that were unexpected in a really great way. We talked about purpose, whether it's born, whether it's learned, how you can lean into it, how you can discover new versions of yourself and different interests that you may not have explored yet. We talked about what goal setting really is, right? Looking at that future version of yourself who already has that goal and asking yourself, what is this future version of myself doing? What actions are they taking on a daily basis? Who are the influences that are around them? and then closing that gap between where you are now and that future version. We talked about new environments. We talked about healing. We talked about trauma. We talked about making progress on the journey. We talked about a lot with Stephanie here. And if you took anything away from this conversation, please share this show with just one other person. You're the reason that this show has grown over the past two years because you are the best part of the Be Better team. Be sure to go get your copy of Stephanie's workbook, Making the Impossible inevitable at stephanie zamora slash make it happen links are in the description it's a free workbook enter your name and email she'll send it right over to you as always thank you so much for watching and listening to the show and until we talk again next time continue to be better